Hi, my name is Isan Taylor. I'm with I Love the Berg, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the city of St. Petersburg. We're about to get started with today's host, Monica Kyle, who's live in the old Northeast neighborhood of St. Petersburg, Florida. Her husband, John Kyle, is going to be running the slideshow for us today. You're going to see a mix of live footage from Monica, slides with historic photos from John, and we hope you enjoy. If you have a question during our live tour, please feel free to use the comment section. We're going to do our best to work in as many questions during the live tour as possible. Once again, thank you for joining us. Be sure to follow I Love the Bird on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as subscribing to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next history tour, the latest news, exclusive deals, and all things good in the Berg. With that, Monica, it's over to you. All right. Thank you, Isa. Hello, everybody. Again, I'm Monica Kyle, and I'm joined by Dex Fabian, who is the publisher of I Love the Berg, is behind the camera. My husband, John, doing slides. And again, thanks, Isa, for introducing us. Thanks also to the city of St. Petersburg for their support on these virtual tours. So we're starting, we're in the historic Old Northeast today. And I am standing on 18 Northeast, which is one of the loveliest streets in the Old Northeast. And a lot of people think of it as kind of the epitome of the neighborhood. Very popular street on Halloween uh, is the time when a lot of people visit the Old Northeast for the first time. Uh, but it really does a nice job of showing the characteristics that people have come to love about the historic Old Northeast. It's got brick streets. There's hexagon block sidewalks that we'll see later. Tree canopies on many of the roads. And some gracious old historic homes we'll talk about today. We're just gonna see a sliver of the Old Northeast. We're gonna see 18th Avenue, a little bit of 14th, a little bit of 13th Avenue, and some of the waterfront. But you, we could do this tour three different ways, and we may have to do another one of, uh, particularly of Granada Terrace, which is another really special part of the Old Northeast. John, do me a favor and throw up that map so I can kind of tell people where we are and explain a little bit of the, the history of the historic Old Northeast. Is that up, John? It sure is. Okay, so the, the story of the Old Northeast is really one of the early boom history of St. Petersburg. The neighborhood was platted in 1911 and as part of the first big boom that we had, which was really a land boom, a lot of uh, lots, empty lots changing hands multiple times in a day when developers and speculators are bidding up the price of land. That boom goes bust in about 1919 as we um, with World War One, and then we pick up again with another boom in 1920 when a lot of our houses get built. The map that you're seeing shows the boundaries of the old northeast and the boundaries are Fifth Avenue north on the south up to about 30th Avenue north on the north, Fourth Street on the west and then Tampa Bay and Coffee Pot Bayou on the east. The neighborhood is actually developed in phases. So, John, that, uh, actually stay on that first map. From 5th Avenue to 9th Avenue, which is a, an area that was known at the time as Bayshore, was developed first. It's got narrower streets. The lots are smaller. They're about 45 feet wide, typically. The houses are closer to the street. We then get a second phase of development where 9th to 22nd Avenue is developed. The streets get wider. The lots get wider, they're about 60 feet. The houses get bigger, particularly as you move closer to the water. We then get a phase of development from 22nd to 30th. And then there's a separate development of Granada Terrace, which is sort of a little enclave in the Old Northeast, which we'll do on another tour. But we're going to be touring 18th and 13th today. So John, show that second map. We're going to be walking east down 18th avenue then we'll hook a right on um, north shore drive and then we'll turn back into the neighborhood on 14th where again we're seeing just a small sliver of the neighborhood day we're going to start actually by looking at this house over here if Dex, you can follow me this way so the house that dex is showing now it's one of my favorite in the old Northeast. It is uh, a 1920 house. So it was one of the earliest, as I said, the neighborhood was platted in 1911, but a lot of the development didn't start happening here until late teens. And really during the second boom period is when we get a lot of our 
homes and just major buildings built in St. Pete. So a lot of our big hotels, a lot of our churches, public buildings start to be built during the second boom, which was really more of a building boom than our first one. So this is a great example of the kind of grand houses that were encouraged by the developer Perry Sell, who platted this neighborhood. This one was built from a man named E.P. Harrison, who was one of the early pioneers of the city. He was the owner of St. Pete Hardware. When you've got a booming city, hardware is a, a, a hot commodity. So he was one of the proprietors of St. Pete Hardware, which was later renamed Harrison Hardware. He sits on the school board and many other boards in the city. Um, and when researching him, I found a, an interesting anecdote that I think tells a lot about the city of St. Pete in 1911, when the Old Northeast was platted. So this house was built in 1920. He moves into it in 1920. But in 1911, E.P. Harrison is the secretary of the school board. And there's a story in the newspaper about him. Now, this is about 20 years after the city is founded in 1888. About 20 years later, they're celebrating Washington's birthday with a huge school parade. So it's become the biggest celebration in the city, eventually Festival of States Parade, which was the most popular event in the city for many, many years. But originally it was Washington's birthday. In 1911, the Confederate veterans were to march in the parade and the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the Union veterans, was also to march in the parade and took exception to the Confederate veterans carrying their flag. They complained to the superintendent of the school board. He asked Confederate veterans not to carry their flag. The Confederate veteran said, no flag, we're not marching. And there's a huge protest in response to this. The superintendent of the schools who asked the Confederate not to carry their flag is beat up. He's harassed for days afterwards and eventually is essentially pressured to resign as the superintendent of schools for his action. E.P. Harrison is the secretary of the school board who accepts his resignation. So not throwing any mud at all on E.P. Harrison. I don't know where he stood on the issue, but it does tell us a lot about the culture of the city at that time. We're geographically and culturally Southern and the city is developing just 20 years after its founding. It's booming with a lot of wealthy Northerners moving in town. So there's a tension between these two factions and it's something that continues on through St. Peter's history. So don't ever let anybody tell you we are not part of the South here in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, so when you look at a beautiful house like this, you may not think of these stories of what the sort of underlying racial tensions that are often happening in a city like St. Petersburg. This is a Georgian style building, which is characterized by a very symmetrical mass of the building, the big part of the building, and then symmetrical windows and doors. Um, and that's a yellow brick. Uh, the Georgian buildings are usually made out of brick. The really great characteristic of this house is the tile roof. So if you can zoom in on that, you can see it's a green tile and it's actually something called Ludowisi tile. If you've ever heard of Ludowisi, Georgia, that's actually named after the tile factory. They had one of their factories there. But Ludowisi is a tile that's been made. We'll keep walking down this way, Dex. I talk. Ludowisi is a, a, a family in Italy that were tile manufacturers. They've been making tile in the U.S. since the 1880s. And they make this beautiful green tile that has been. John, actually, throw up those pictures of the other sites with Ludowisi tile that are used. Yeah, yeah so yeah, we've got um, the the Pennsylvania State House, uh, which people may not be familiar with, but the um, New York Life Building they probably are, and also the Plaza Hotel um, yeah, carry this uh, tile on the roof. So a definite sign of wealth. Yes, and they they are still very active today. We'll actually see another house. Um, so a, a very kind of high style. Um, element used in building here. Perry Snell, when he platted the neighborhood in 1911, his intention was to make what was then called North Shore, the neighborhood later renamed as the historical Northeast many decades later. But when it was first built, it was called North Shore. And Perry Snell and his partner, J.C. Hamlet, invested heavily in promotion of it as the premier neighborhood in St. Petersburg. They had deed restrictions that said things like your house had to cost at least five thousand um, dollars you couldn't have livestock on the property uh, it had the house had to face north or south 
Um, and notably, you could not have African-Americans living in the main house. Now, they were allowed to live on the property if they lived in an ancillary building, the servants' quarters, essentially. So um, very restrictive and promoted as such. In our early boom period, we had a mix of houses that were developed either by the, the, the individual homeowner that purchased a lot and then hired an architect to design a house in the style they wanted, or perhaps by a developer who bought several lots and built several houses in a, a recognizable style, which we'll see in a minute. But I want to point out this house as an example of one that would have been bought, the lot would have been purchased by an individual. They would have hired an architect and built a house, probably in a style that they were familiar with from up north. So a nice characteristic of the old northeast is you get a real mix of styles. It's not all just Mediterranean revival because a lot of people are bringing the style that they're familiar with from their northern homes. Um, I love the exposed rafter tails on this house. Uh, you can see the, the sort of ends of the truss, trusses that come out past the, um, the wall and just give it a really nice look. You have this kind of gargoyle on the front here. This house was built by George Davis. Let me get his name right. George Smith. George D. Smith, who, interestingly, he was a developer. He was the son-in-law of a man named Charles Begol, who was the president of Chevy Motor Company and also one of the founders of Buick Motor Company. And Charles Begol actually died here in St. Pete when he was visiting his daughter and son-in-law. Not in this house, in a house on uh, Lane Court, actually. But uh, it shows you, it speaks to the kind of wealth and um, status that the people in the old Northeast, or at that time, North Shore, had when they were moving here. We're gonna be crossing Walnut. And actually, Deck, if you look this way, if I don't know if you can see those, John, can you see the people coming out of that house right there? Uh, Just on the next street, on the next corner of the next street. They're filming a movie for the I Hallmark can't, but Channel. But I've got right it there. smaller on my screen. So, Say that again, there's a bunch of people come, there, That's where they're filming the movie for the Hallmark Channel right now. So all those yeah. people coming out of that house over there, that's part of the crew for the Hallmark Channel. Okay, so. We've just crossed Walnut, and this block from Walnut down to the next street, it's a block of 10 houses. It's actually its own local historic district. So this block only has protections from the city on things like demolitions or alterations to, to the outside of the building. This is something that's being seen more and more in St. Pete as residents of some of these older neighborhoods are concerned about the character of their neighborhood and protecting their property values as they see it. Um, they're trying to prevent demolitions of some of the older homes. Um, and if a home is demolished, trying to have some say in what gets built in its place. Across the street over here, these are a couple of examples of homes that were built by a developer on what we would call today on spec. So a developer built the houses and then sold them later to interested buyers. These were both built by the School Murphy Construction Company. And they're both mission style. They, they look different though. And that's because the one on the right has been cast in or clad in permastone, which is essentially a version of like aluminum siding that was sold in the 40s and 50s, kind of door to door, and it was sold as a way to protect your house. So underneath that house, that siding that is looks like a faux stone would be something more like you see on the house to the left. So uh, um, a plaster uh, with a stucco that's, um, that had much more of a mission or Mediterranean revival style look to it. So those two houses and then this yellow one just beyond kind of orange one was another school murphy house this house 736 is an example of a new of new construction that was just built here in this local historic district um, and a good example of how the um I'm trying to think of the right word here how the guidelines of a local historic district help to make new construction fit into 
the existing neighborhood. Um, Can there we get a better examples. look at that house real quick? Can you have Dex pan up yeah, higher on that Dex, house? Because we only kind of saw the bottom sure. half of that one. They want to um, see more of this house. So yeah. kind of triangle. Yeah, go up a little bit, Dex, upper. again. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So this is new construction. Um, and it was actually, this was sort of a heated debate here in the old Northeast because the home that was here was demolished um, after this was made a local historic district. So there has been a lot of push and pull in the historical Northeast and other neighborhoods like it um, because we're losing, most of these homes are very well cared for, but occasionally you'll find one that is not and a developer will come in, purchase that home and demolish it. and uh, build two or three in its place because the what the lots are so wide here in the old northeast. This is the last house in this small little micro local historic district, if you will, just ten houses. Now, typically, the concept of a local historic district is that you would have a thousand houses. You know, the entire neighborhood would be designated as a local historic district, but because of the rules in St. Petersburg, it's very a large neighborhood because you have that 50% plus one of the homeowners in the neighborhood agree to become a local historic district. It used to be even harder than that. It used to be 60, I think, 60 or 66%. Um, percent. The Old Northeast tried it in 2004 and couldn't get, came very close, but couldn't get the vote totals to make the whole neighborhood a, a local historic district. I just like to point out this house. It's a four square kind of Italian styling, but for many years it was the home of uh, Paul Tash, who's the CEO of the uh, Tampa Bay Times. So there's always been sort of prominent uh, people living here in the old Northeast because of its beauty, but also because of proximity to downtown. It makes it very easy to get to work. You can ride your bike, you can walk. I'm going to show one more house, John, and then I'm going to ask you to put up those slides. Sure. This is one of my favorite houses. This is known as the Sergeant House after the couple that lived here when it was built. It's a high style craftsman bungalow. Um, and it is now a local historic landmark. It used to include the lot next door and it had a matching garage. That part was demolished and the lot was sold off before they named this a local historic landmark. So now this building itself is protected. What I love about it uh, amongst its many characteristics of craftsman style is the clinker brick and i don't want to go up on their property but if you can if you can, how much you can focus in on that brick there dex so clinker brick i want to make sure i get this right um, they're produced when wet clay bricks are exposed to excessive heat and in the old kilns the the kilns of the early 20th century they didn't heat evenly and so the bricks that were too close to the fire came out harder darker and with more vibrant colors, depending on the minerals that were in the clay. And originally those bricks were discarded. They were called clinker bricks because of the sound they made when you knocked them together to clink. But they were considered undesirable and thrown out until the arts and crafts movement, which sort of praised organic things. Um, two architects in California, the Green Brothers, sort of started using these clinker bricks and made them very fashionable and i love them um and they're so charming and you know unusual they're all different they're kind of irregular there's a match to this house so we're on 18th avenue northeast there's actually a almost identical match to this house over on 20th but look at the curves on the underneath the windows here the curves of the um of the columns and the brackets underneath the roof line there's a setback porch it's really a great example of craftsman bungalow. John, go ahead and throw up that picture of the other, it's twin on 20th. And we're going to walk down to the water if you want to show those other slides as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So first you're going to see, this is a twin uh, to that house on, which is over on 20th Avenue. Just another really cool, very unusual uh, looking house. Uh, even though it is in a, a similar style to other houses in the neighborhood. I'm going to go backwards in my slides here and show you this, going back in what Monica was talking about before, this is Harrison Hardware, when it became Harrison Hardware from being St. Pete Hardware. If you were on any of these other tours, when we did 4th Avenue, uh, we talked about, or was it 2nd Avenue, we talked about- 2nd um, Avenue, yeah. Yeah, 2nd Avenue, when 
they shared a building with the times and then the times moved um same building so this will all be on the on the final exam um and when we're doing research on this this is how you can go down any street and start putting in addresses in in uh the in the search engines and this is where we got that story about trowbridge and and the confederate and the union army veterans marching in the parade together um and then later on harrison who was the owner of that house with the beautiful green roof um getting honored when he when he passed away um and then here is an ad, an early ad from when Snell and Hamlet uh, developed North Shore. And I want to read what Monica was talking about with those, those restrictions. Uh, this, was, this is in the ad, and I'm going to read it because it's kind of small in the ad. Our building restrictions are such that nothing but desirable residents can be put on these lots. So no matter where you build on this property, you will be protected. And... You know, that's, you know, probably a lot of code words for the kind of neighborhood they were trying to to, to establish at the time. Um, and these ads on this next screen really show how aggressively uh, real estate was being pushed in St. Petersburg. It was really geared towards second homeowners, people buying their second homes as safe investments. Um, in this area, they were really trying to attract um investment money people who these were not this was not for school teachers and local people you know working class people this was this was to bring in investors and property flippers and, and that sort of thing um and john we're we, at the are you there uh, let me just mention this last slide mentions the streetcar line that ran through the neighborhood that was another amenity so you could get downtown on a streetcar back then and, and to, to go ahead, Isa, and take that uh, down and, and go back to, there you go. So we're, I mentioned that, thank you, John. I mentioned yeah. that um, there was another house with Luda with the child. This is it. It's at sort of the foot of 18th Avenue. It's this grand home, uh, originally known as the Cumestead House. And it also, here, Dex, we'll kind of move up this way, kind of get some perspective of the front of it with its beautiful green. I'm obsessed with this Luda with the tile now that I know what it is. Um, this house at 1800 North Shore gave rise to one of the enduring ghost stories of St. Pete because for many years, the widow that lived in this house, Cumstead was her last name, left a light burning in the front window and it gave rise to all these theories on why she did that. They said she had a runaway son that she was leaving a light burning uh, to try and, you know, entice home. They said she killed her husband and uh, she was keeping the body in the house and all, all kinds of, I don't know how that relates to the light in the window, but that's what they said. Um, so for years, there are all these stories. Turns out she had some religious belief where they believe you should keep a light burning at all times in your house. Um, but it's sort of an enduring ghost story. You still hear about St. Pete. As we cross the street carefully, because people come around these corners pretty quick. Yes, if you can look that way. I don't know how well you can see, John, across the water there, that kind of grand taupe yeah. colored house. That was Perry Snell's house. So he lived right uh, across the water. To, I want Issa also to throw up the, the picture of the, the backyard pool for the house oh, we were right, just talking yeah. about there. It's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful backyard. Um, yeah, after the house. Cumsteads lived in that house, it was bought by James Bourne, who was a a big insurance salesman, um, also a vice president of the Mason Company, which built Princess Martha and a lot of other boom era hotels in St. Pete. Um, again, just more examples of kind of the um, wealth and power residing in the old Northeast. Oh, Hello. Hey, oh, no, we're going over to the sundial. <sighs> so, people out walking their dogs. Um, I said in my promo of the, the, uh, this tour that I would teach you what an animal a, animatic sundial is. This is an animal, eh, I can't pronounce it, animatic sundial. And it is a sundial that a vertical feature, in this case, a person, me, stands in the appropriate location based on the time of year. So if you look down on the this basalt stone that this is made out of it has the months listed the july august april so we are in august so i would stand up here now if the sun was out 
it would cast my shadow on the appropriate time. So it's kind of a human sundial. Um, this was put here in 2010 as part of the commemoration for the Waterfront Park's centennial. Dex, there's a, a plaque over here that um, explains it. There used to be a sundial in this general location. It was actually a little farther south in here at what was called at the time Vista Point. There was one in the 30s. There was one later in the 70s. And during the centennial of the waterfront parks, which were started here in 1910, so the centennial was in 2010, um, a old Northeast resident um, and really active preservationist, Robin Reed, uh, came up with the idea of, of commemorating it with this sundial. So sculptor Eric Higgs put it together. There was a lot of fundraising. And it really has brightened up what had become kind of a decrepit part of the park. This park is a, a real showpiece of the old Northeast. I think anyone living in the old Northeast will tell you um, that one of the best amenities is having this long system of waterfront parks right out your front door. And Perry Snell knew that. Um, and he, in fact, deeded this portion of the park, so 13th Avenue North, he deeded it to the city because he knew a waterfront park system would enhance the values of his north. He also built the seawall. He put in the trolley line, or he extended the trolley line, I should say, as John mentioned earlier. Very clever in his promotion um, in order to sell his, his lots. Again, you can see there's some barricades in the street up here from where they're filming this movie. We're going to go to this house here. So this next house we're going to, yeah, I know I have like, I've said every house is my favorite, but I really think this one's my favorite. If this I won the favorite. lottery, <laughs> this is, if I won the lottery, this is the house that I would buy. Um, and it was built in 1920 for L.M. Alex, L. M. Alexander, who was a wealthy paper manufacturer out of Wisconsin. His cousin was actually married to Thomas Edison. So he was all buddy buddy with Thomas Edison. So they built this beautiful house, which had all the hardware with solid bronze. The as we kind of come a little farther forward in the building, you'll see that the it has this great sort of arched loggia and the doors would swing, they would roll back actually. So you could open up the dining room. Um, to the outside and have this great view of the water in your waterfront park. It was later in 1944 bought by Elmer Hastings, who owned the largest chick hatchery in the United States. And I think they made, let me say, I'll tell you exactly how many, 14 million chicks a year. Their output was 14 million chicks a year. So chickens, so that's how they made their money. It's now owned by a, um, an Indian family. And I don't know if you noticed over the door, there's a, uh, Inscription it says Arya Bhavan, um, which is in India, maybe I don't know. Arya. Um, it's a Sanskrit word, means wide or of noble character, and it's used to show respect to others. And Bhavan is a place in Indian, it means our home. So Arya Bhavan is kind of this respect for home. Um, and I love it. I love this house. So Dex, I want you to show this sidewalk here. So this is the famous hexagon block sidewalks that we have in the old Northeast and, and other historic neighborhoods in St. Pete. And this one has the great layout of the tile, the colored tile. Now there's been these different theories on, you know, whether this was modeled after Rio de Janeiro where they have these colorful sidewalks. Um, this is one of the best preserved ones I've seen of the colorful ones um, here in St. Pete. They were great because you could replace just an individual block and they would shift with sand. They're also bad <laughs> because they also pop up for that same reason and they can create a trip hazard. John, we're going to walk down to 14th. So why don't you show yeah. the slides and we're going to walk fast because we're running a little bit behind. Sure. Um, this first slide, um, actually someone was asking in the comments how they can get a little history on their home. And one of the sources that we use a lot is newspapers.com. Um, where you can go in and it's a, it requires a subscription, but you can just start searching for addresses and street names and stuff. And, you know, it takes some practice to figure out how to, how to search and what to, what you get when you do search. But here is where we found the story about Thomas Edison being invited uh, to the festival of States by the mayor. And 
you know, I don't, I don't believe that he actually came to it, but you know, it was newsworthy enough that, that the mention was in there. That well, uh, that and he was, was going to stay at LM Alexander's house. That was right. He was right. Stay at that house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this next shot is a neat kind of aerial artist rendering of of Snell Isle and Granada Terrace, and. One of the cool things, you know, we know of baseball's long history in St. Pete, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But Snell owned all this land, and in this rendering, really, we're only developing this little corner here. The, the bulk of the Northeast is not shown as having any houses on it yet. And in fact, when you hit 22nd Ave North, which is kind of where my arrow is there, that's the end of the city limits. And Snell put a baseball field right here where these streets are shown. This is 1920. In 1914, he put in a baseball field here where Granada Terrace sits today, where the first uh, spring training game in St. Pete was held. Uh, in 1915, they actually attracted a permanent, um, the Cubs came to train. And on the first day of spring training, all the businesses in St. Pete closed so that uh, people could attend. The streetcar was run up to the ball field. People, uh, Al Lang, who was more instrumental in bringing the Yankees and getting more permanent home for spring training in St. Pete, complained about how far out of town uh, the field was. So that just shows how undeveloped this area was. It was kind of a sandy, a grass fire threatened to burn the grandstand, which is shown here. It held almost a thousand people from this uh, Museum of History archive. Um, and it looks like Monica is probably getting close to we're, are you there yet I yeah we're almost slide. yes you can start showing yeah. it and then the the house will be in the background as you show okay it. We're almost so there was a lot of speculation about down. where this ballpark was and it was just right up here on the edge of coffee pot bayou where the streetcar came out and there was another house over on is it on 14th or 15th 14th 14th yep 14th where right there was here. a log cabin um, uh, up until 2004, there was a, an anachronism for the neighborhood on two lots, a log cabin, uh, which Babe right Ruth here. and Lou Gehrig used to hang out, and, although they didn't like each other very much, play cards, smoke cigars. When the property was bought and, and they wanted to build a new uh, couple of homes there, uh, the owner did not want to see this log cabin go to waste, so they took it apart log by log to set it up uh, over in Hillsborough County out in the country where it would maybe fit in with the setting. I can neither confirm nor de deny that it actually got set up. I couldn't find any information on that cabin actually getting reassembled, but uh, supposedly out in, uh, out in Hillsborough County somewhere, Babe Ruth's uh, clubhouse still stands. I'm an optimist. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's there. You know, I, I, I could probably pick up the phone and make a couple of phone calls um, if I had <laughs> another day to plan. <laughs> so. Hello. Good, thanks. How are you? And this people is a, a common are very, We're doing a virtual tour. So I'm just saying, I'm saying how friendly the people in the old so. <laughs> All the dog walkers. Yes, so. lots of dog walkers. It's a nice, cool right. evening for one. You, you put yeah. pressure on me, Mon. I, 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 I breezed through that. There was a lot of uh, speculation on where that ball field stood because it's hard to say where the, the, you know, some thought it was up as far north as the Masonic home, but I did find that trolley map that showed it down more around where 22nd you, Ave was located. In the like 15 years that I've been doing historic tours, the where is the ball, where was the ball field? It's like a big question. It's so weird that nobody could quite figure out where it was. Thank you, John. I want to show this house next. Um, this was the home of Flora Wiley. So that whole section of the park that we just walked by is known now as Flora Wiley Park. And Flora Wiley, Flora was her first name, Wiley was her last name, moved here in, to St. Pete in 1919. And she was a huge advocate for the park system until her death in 1965. She and her husband, Walter, built this house in 1922. It's a replica of an Italian villa they saw when visiting Milan. They took photos and specifications and brought them back to their architect, Henry Taylor, who is the same architect that built the Vinoy. Um, and he built this lovely villa for them. It, it's one of the greatest features of it. You may be able to see it a little better if you come a little closer this way, is these great gargoyle rain spouts, which I don't know that these ones are actually functioning rain spouts, but in the uh, in the Italian villa, they certainly were. And 
Flora Wiley's niece, who was orphaned as a young child, came to live with her and grew up basically in this house for like 35 years. And she wrote this wonderful memoir of living in this house. And she talked about the gargoyle rain spouse and just how wonderful a woman Flora Wiley was. And she was this fabulous gardener. And this whole front yard was a big lily pond that has been taken out and a circular driveway put in. But she Are was a big 14th, advocate. Mom? Is that 14th or 13th? Yes, we're on, we're on the corner of 14th and Beach. Beach. Yeah. Um, she was a big advocate for having indigenous fauna in our parks um, and in her, her gardens. So you know, she wanted the, the landscape to look like Florida landscape. Um, so really a wonderful, one of our kind of leading, she started the St. Pete Garden Club, um, just a, a great woman. I actually went in this house a few years ago. Ooh, I could see they're in having dinner and, right now. And I think those gargoyles are actual functioning rain spots. Are they functioning? I, I can't, I couldn't I, remember when I we went on that I seem to remember, I seem to remember that, yeah. that, that, that. I could, let's just go with that. Yeah, exactly. So Dex, well, I could see the people in their living room, so I could ask them. Um, I'm going to have Dex just sh show this beautiful Med, uh, Med Rev Mediterranean Revival home here, which is probably another 1920s home. What's interesting is that across the street, and if Dex is going to go to keep the camera steady, I'm a fast walker. Um, across the street, we have a bunch of 1950s infill homes. So I mentioned that we had the big land boom of 1910 to 1917. Then we have the big building boom, 1920 to 1926. And then that goes bust about three years before the rest of the country enters the Great Depression. And we don't really get much building in St. Pete at all until the 1950s, well, post-World War II. So that's when we get a lot of what we call infill houses. So houses like these three little ones. This empty lot, across the street from us here with the fencing around it, had a house there until just recently. I, I don't know when they actually demolished it, but I did a tour here maybe a year ago and it was still standing. It was a 1947 house, pretty large actually for a 1947 house. Uh, but it was interesting, the people that built it, he was, their last name was Harney. He was an engine, uh, chemical engineer for Monsanto Foods, which, Monsanto kind of ends up in the news a lot these days for um, things they put in their food. Look how pretty with the lights over the street and the canopy. Sorry, I had to digress because the street is so pretty. Um, but Harney, who lived in this house, he and his wife had lived in Japan for six years and became very familiar with Japanese gardening and had created this huge show garden in this um, in, at their home here. The house was later owned by State Senator Jeff Brandis, who I think was probably the last owner um, that he just moved out of that house a couple of years ago. And it's since been demolished. And it's, I can tell by the sign in the front that it's owned by one of the developers that has been doing a lot of um, demolition and building in some of our historic neighborhoods and has been um, a focus of a lot of tension. <laughs> this, okay, now this might be my favorite house. I love this house. Um, it's a brick Tudor style. The last time I was doing a tour here, the gentleman that lived in it came out. He lived here for like, he's lived here for like 40 years. Um, I don't know if he bought it directly from the McDonald's who the one-time owner was Rex McDonald who owned the Coliseum from the Coliseum on Mirror Lake, which was, you know, a place where all the big bands came, a huge dance floor. He owned it um, 1950s on. His widow owned it all the way until 1989. Rex McDonald himself had played in some of the the bands that played there at 19 and came to own the Coliseum. Lived in his house, was later a city council person. Um, it's a great brick style English tutor and just it's a beautifully on this lot with all these trees. I want to show Dex the street here if you can. Will the camera go down that way? What's interesting about, now you can see it's brick as we go um, west towards 4th Street, it's all brick. But Dex, if you turn that way, you can see it's been paved in asphalt from here to the water. The asphalt is coming out, coming off in certain places. At one time, there were, let's see, let me get my statistics correctly. Okay. 
1941, and Dex will walk while I'm saying this, and you can show some of the houses walking. We're going to end on the next block. In 1941, there were approximately 339 miles of red brick streets in St. Petersburg. Now there's about 81 miles of brick streets left. So most of those have been pulled up completely. In some neighborhoods, they've been paved over like we see back there. But as you can tell, the asphalt doesn't seem to last as long as the brick. And the nice thing about the brick streets is they allow rainwater to come through them. They're you know more porous. I just put up that <laughs> slide. Of, I just put up that slide, Mon, of the the brick the remaining Hold brick streets in St. Pete. Hold on, one so. sec, get done the. Go ahead. Oh, you did? Oh, that's right. Yes. How are you? Nice to see you, John. <laughs> nice. Mo moving on. John, we're doing a virtual tour, so there's like lots of people watching on I Love the Berg. <laughs> Our former neighbor John now lives here and I <laughs> see you guys Small world. um the brick streets are also nice as you and I know John for traffic calming which is good for if you have kids and animals people can't drive as fast on the brick street so yeah. we're gonna end at the stop sign show that map of the brick streets and what's remaining yeah I had I that up while you were talking about it yeah and I don't and know if I you can, if you take can. it down. <laughs> okay. Well, if you if you really study that map, you'll note that the places where the red lines are, where the bricks still are, they're all the historic neighborhoods. So it's the old Northeast, right. Kenwood, Pasadena, places like that. Hello, um, Dex. I want to point out that building right there, four fifty six. This is the Marianne Apartments, and as the old Northeast was developing as we entered into periods of depression after the 1920s boom, people were really trying to maximize the investment that they'd made. They thought, well, I'm gonna build this grand house, maybe I'm gonna sell it. And now all of a sudden nobody's buying. So they start building things like these apartment buildings. The Marianne is interesting because it's built to look like a single family home, but it's actually multiple apartments. So people start building uh, multifamily apartment buildings. They start adding garage apartments if they already have a single family home. If they have a garage, all of a sudden they can put an apartment on top of it and they can rent that out. People are still traveling during the Depression, particularly to St. Pete because we have spring training. So people were doing anything they could to maximize their income when they couldn't sell real estate. Um, so that's where we get a lot. 22% uh, of the houses in St. Pete have garage apartments. So a lot, particularly the neighborhoods near downtown, because that's where the tourists wanted to be staying. Um, we're gonna show these two buildings on the corner here and then we'll wrap it up. I think we're, we need to call this history 45 minutes, but it just doesn't have the same ring to it as a history half hour. Um, so Dex, show that house right there, 406. And John, why don't you tell them what you found out about the, the people that lived in 406. 406. There was a, a gentleman lived there for about 50 years. He was a retired colonel. And his obituary said that he fought in the Mexican War, World War I, and World War II. He would have had to be about 140 years old, I think, to do all of those. Um, but it said he had uh, commendation from Eisenhower and the Pope and a lot of people. It was an interesting obituary. I'm sure half of it was true and all made it very exciting. But his son was also a military man, became a missile expert after World War II and was attending a rocketry conference and noticed the Russians acting strangely. And his son was kind of credited with being the first to, to tip off the Americans that the Russians were going to launch Sputnik. And it's because he saw the Russians acting really weird at this uh, scientific conference in Europe that they were all pretending to be friends at. And um, so, and that's the sort of thing. And, and as Monica said at the beginning, you could walk down any of these streets and, and come up with a bunch of colorful stories about people really anywhere in St. Pete, but, that, but that's kind of how we, we come up with some of this stuff. Yes, I should tell everybody not to get a subscription to newspapers.com because the rabbit holes you can go down and oh, finding out these stories yeah. about people. It's <laughs> Our kids don't know us because we're like sucked into uh, these stories all the time. We'll finish talking about the San Rafael 
apartments, which were built in 1926 with concrete. So concrete was sweeping the country at the time for its ease and affordability, ease of construction and affordability. This was one of the first all concrete buildings in St. Pete. It featured 24 apartments. And interestingly, downstairs on the bottom floor here where you have these arches, there were six businesses. There was a tea room, a drugstore, a book and novelty shop, a beauty parlor, a grocery store, and a meat market. Those six businesses were converted into apartments in the 1940s. Um, and it really kind of speaks to, there are some other houses, some of the other large houses in the old Northeast were converted into assisted living facilities, um, adult living, you know, congregate facilities in the 70s when St. Peter General was entering a period of decline. And there was some pushback from the neighborhood on that. So the old Northeast, I think like many neighborhoods, you know, there's this tension between um, who's living here, what businesses we want here, what type of people we want living here. And like any healthy community, I think there's some really healthy push and pull. Um, and it's particularly active in the old Northeast because it is such a beautiful place to live and it's got this great proximity to downtown. So like John said, we could have gone down any number of streets. We didn't cover sunken gardens. Those are tours on their own on the outskirts of uh, the old Northeast. But I hope we've given you a little bit to chew on and to think about the next time you're visiting the old Northeast. Thanks to Dex for filming, uh, John for doing these wonderful slideshows and commentary. Thanks, Isa. Again, thanks to the city of St. Pete for their partnership on this project. So signing off, we'll see you on the next History Half Hour. Thanks.